a short Q&A video with some questions that I've had around the topical concerns of the moment. Hi Malin, in your last video you talked about the Twitter files and shadow banning at Twitter. However, Twitter defines shadow banning as the making of someone's post invisible to everyone but themselves and it is actually true that Twitter did not do that. So what do you say to that? And the charge by some that all the Twitter files revelations are, to coin a phrase, a nothing burger. Yeah, well, Bill Clinton once famously tried to redefine what did or didn't count as sexual relations in order to convince people that he hadn't told lies. It didn't fly then, kind of shouldn't fly now. When conservatives used to complain that they were being shadow banned, they weren't using this uber strict definition that former Twitter executives are insisting is the one true definition. They noted that their followers weren't seeing their tweets so often, that their tweets weren't getting retweeted so much. They noted that things were one way and then all of a sudden something changed. Basically, all the things that we've now had confirmed that there were tags for and that they had indeed been applied to at least some of those people. So it's just culture war nonsense that turns this discussion into a game of semantics. How much can a company quietly and without telling you suppress your reach on their system before it becomes a real shadow ban? Now, I would prefer that we instead agree that all of these companies, whoever runs them, should identify rules in granular enough detail that we can all understand them. They should be transparent about what action they've taken against who, on what exact grounds, and they should all have the right of appeal. That's all. Personally, I don't care what the rules are, because that's kind of the choice of the company directors, so long as they're transparent and consistently applied because then we can all make the choice about whether we want to sign up to that platform or not. Now, maybe all of those people deserve to have restrictions placed on their content, but if it's open, that can be tested and challenged. The idea that tech company founders get to be unelected arbiters of free speech based on invisible criteria, unannounced enforcement, that's just not a definition of an accountable process that I'd recognise. Now, does that mean the former Twitter executives were bad people? No. I mean, they might be. There's no evidence per se. Does it mean they should be harassed and harangued by people who have read the Twitter files and they're making 2 plus 2 equal 5? Obviously not. I mean, of course not. First, because you just shouldn't. And secondly, because nothing undermines the process of disclosure that's going on faster than making those sorts of consequences the result. Look, two things can be true at once. One, the people at Twitter made largely ad hoc decisions based on what they believed were the best outcomes given what they knew at the time. Two, because of the extraordinary political bias of Twitter staff, in line with all the tech companies, that process of ad hocery inevitably led to ideology-influenced decisions, whether knowingly or not knowingly, some of which were bad decisions. There's been no evidence of Twitter bosses as evil tech masterminds unfolding their plan to use technology to beat down the right and to dominate the world, therefore. But good intentions developed in an ideological echo chamber can quickly go bad. Now, Jack Dorsey, the former founder, had some interesting things to say about this in a post in response to the Twitter files. He said this, The biggest mistake I made was continuing to invest in building tools for us to manage the public conversation versus building tools for the people using Twitter to easily manage it for themselves. This burdened the company with too much power and opened us to significant outside pressure, such as advertising budgets. And then he added this, I generally think companies have become far too powerful and that became completely clear to me with our suspension of Trump's account. As I've said before, we did the right thing for the public company business at the time, but the wrong thing for the internet and society. Ironically, some of all this happened because Twitter and the companies like it failed at one of their stated core values, namely diversity. 99% of those Twitter employees making political donations for the midterm elections donated to Democrats. 99%. Now, that's the most remarkable failure of diversity for a platform that deals most prominently with political speech. The former heads of diversity talked a lot about skin colour, about gender, about sexual orientation. It seemed like they embraced every flavour of difference, so long as you fought the same as they did. 
ironically, I was involved with corporate responsibility decades ago before ESG was a thing that had become partly politicised. We talked about old-fashioned diversity, equal opportunities, and the business case for that sort of diversity was that any business would benefit from having different viewpoints in the room where decisions were made because people were creating echo chambers long before the culture wars. Whether it was around bro culture, meaning that some marketing department thought this ad would be a good idea, for instance. And you could make it work by having strong corporate values that were based on human universal values around which very different people could nevertheless build a sense of shared identity. Now, that old version of diversity, which I supported then and support to this day, has at least partly, maybe largely, given way to an identity politics version where difference is defined around specific subset of identity characteristics, and it's made to work, in as much as it does, by building a sense of shared identity around all having the same political viewpoints. Now, the people concerned believe this to be the same as having universal values, it's just that they think that half of the population are aberrations. Maybe that's viable for a business whose mission and purpose is to sell only to people of the same political viewpoint, which 20 years ago would have been a puzzling niche. I mean, you just ask yourself, why would you restrict yourself in that way? Now, with the culture wars in full swing, maybe it's just how business is going to end up working in the future. But that is a serious degradation from where we were. It's an act of harm that we did to ourselves. By the way, none of this should be taken to mean that I'm wholly happy with the way that Elon Musk has organised these releases of information. It's all very controlled and drip-feed via specially hand-picked journalists. I'm hoping that he will deliver on promises of more overall transparency across the platform. The content of some of the releases does sometimes raise as many questions as it answers. I'd like to see some data, not just individual examples. Quantity of visibility filtering measures on right-leaning accounts versus on left-leaning accounts, for instance. And a quick related question. Do the Twitter files prove that the 2020 election was stolen and Trump should be recognised as the rightful victor? No, of course not. They showed how certain platforms acted to constrain a story that might have had some impact on the election. We can't tell for sure. And it's good that we now see how that happened. But in spirit, it's still no different to every other election. Throughout the history of America, from the days when the founding fathers were the pool from which presidents were springing, newspapers, which was how most people got their news then, were deeply partisan. Some of them told outright lies about the other side, or indeed positive lies about their own side. Candidates had to solve the problem of how you communicate your message to the country in spite of all of that. And, you know, today we have more routes for doing that directly than we ever had before. So the fact that mainstream media and Twitter and Facebook, they weren't keen on a specific campaign story for the side that they didn't support. Does that make it not a free election? Only if you're going to declare every single previous election as invalid likewise, because none of them would meet this new impossible standard for perfect impartiality. Was it wrong that it happened? Sure. But we've had that discussion. Newspapers are publishers. They can be biased. And it's not as though they try to hide that bias, or most of them. Platforms, yeah, they should be conduits for everyone, based on clearly stated rules of the road. The fact that doesn't work perfectly, to say the least, doesn't suddenly invalidate the election process. And look, I'd add a separate gratuitous comment. As Trump discovered in the midterms, you would be well advised to start focusing on why your man has something to offer America in the years between 2024 and 2028, rather than keep banging on about the last election. I mean, it's up to you. But if you're not going to answer the questions the voters are asking, and they're going to be focused on the future, then they're not going to vote for you. Basic campaign strategy. And that moves us nicely to the next question. Is the worst of US political toxicity past? Too early to conclude that. We're getting some indicators that the polarised extremes in the US political scene may be just waking up to the idea they've overreached, but mostly not. On the right, the failure of Trump-endorsed candidates against expectations, contrasted with the overperformance of Ron DeSantis, who has Trump-like undertones, but is nevertheless a traditional politician. 
That has made it less likely that a Republican will end up as a candidate who will actively attack the election process, which is a good thing. Then there is a significant body of former Trump supporters who are now quite liking the idea of a credible alternative. While, of course, there will still remain a substantial number of diehard Trumpists. On the left, well, not so clear what happens there. The left is and will remain determined to demonise the other side come what may, so they will persuade themselves that Ron DeSantis, or indeed any other candidate that isn't Trump, is de facto worse than Trump. And from their point of view, they might be right in that DeSantis currently, still two years to go, but currently looking more electable than most of the likely candidates that they would be inclined to put up. Now, of course, worse for the Democrats, not necessarily the same as worse for the country. And that may well mean that they lose the election and there may be a significant portion of them refuse to accept the results. Rather depends on who the Democrat candidate is. They play such a high profile on the candidates who didn't accept elections on the other side. It would now be politically extremely difficult for them to do the same thing the very next time. One reason perhaps why Stacey Abrams, who refused to accept her result in 2018, was so quick to do so in 2022. I think they know they have to be at least seen to be the guardians of the Constitution, so that means the peaceful transfer of power. But that conviction could break down, for instance, if Trump is re-elected, at least amongst the broader activist base. And if they believe their own campaign line about someone else being worse than Trump, then we can't guarantee that won't hold regardless of who beats them. They need to learn the lesson of Trump equally. The floating voters will tack to the centre. So put up someone who's competent, unlike last time on both sides, and within sight of the centre, as Biden promised, but yeah, kind of failed to deliver, and you might have a fighting chance. However, political activists live on a tide of hubris tempered by periods of bitter disappointment. So they look at the latest elections and instead of seeing a swing against extremism, they just think that they see a swing towards themselves. And they convince themselves that this means that they are invincible. Nothing is fundamentally fixed with the US system. The two sides are as polarised as ever. The system is broken and doesn't allow stuff to get done in that situation. Now you might have taken one step back from the abyss... Right now, we don't know if that's the start of a journey backwards or just for preparation for a running jump forwards. If we judge Russia harshly for invading Ukraine, should we also judge the US-led coalition's invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq similarly? This is another one of those questions that becomes a stick for the two sides to beat each other with, whereas really, if you step back, it's an invitation to establish consistent rules. Now, we're supposed to have consistent rules, as established by the United Nations Charter. The challenge is always on the periphery where people can disagree on exact definitions. Firstly, if the purpose of a discussion is to draw some exact equivalency, then no, I don't think that holds. Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the intention to annex parts or indeed the whole of the country into its own nation, that is completely contrary to the inviolability of borders that is right at the heart of those principles. If you abandon that principle to suit your political preference today, then you have taken the world back to before a time when any rules applied, in which case might means right. But even if they're not equivalent, how should we judge the US actions with Afghanistan and Iraq? Now, again, I think those two are separate. Afghanistan was providing the base for attacks against the United States, which obviously hit its peak with the September 11th attacks against the World Trade Center, as well as against the Pentagon. I think it's hard not to argue that such an attack doesn't create a different situation that you would expect to provoke a strong reaction. Now, the invasion of Iraq is in the middle. It had no justifiable rationale tied to the September 11 attacks. The link between those two seemed to get drawn because George W. Bush felt that America had to finish the job his father had started. And that, of course, was highly dubious legally, was contested legally at the time. And many, many people have remained savagely critical of the action ever since. Now, I suppose we shouldn't forget that Saddam Hussein had himself violated another country's integrity by invading Kuwait, by which he then put himself beyond the pale in the way that Putin has. And I don't for a moment 
uh, think that it's wrong that an alliance was gotten together to reverse that invasion, the first Gulf War. But that doesn't justify the later invasion by George W. Bush. And of course, it's such actions that led Putin and Xi Jinping to conclude that the rules-based world order was basically intended to apply to everyone but the United States. I think you can see the validity of that criticism without necessarily remotely supporting what Putin has then decided to do on the back of that perspective. The fact is that for all we aspire to the idea that there's a world order that protects the interests of all nations, such things have always been subject to the tolerance of the great powers of the time. The unipolar world power of the last few decades now finds itself challenged by an emerging rival. The question is whether that rivalry can continue to unfold to some degree with agreement on the rules of engagement or whether it means that everything must break down. In which case we default to people doing whatever they can get away with using whatever bullshit justification they can think of on the spur of a moment in order to do so. I wouldn't embrace that outcome too readily just because you may not like some of the current things being done by some of the current actors or some aspects of the status quo. Yes, it's harder to hold world powers to account. That doesn't change, but it does happen. It will be harder, not easier, in a world that's defined purely by power. So at least try to make things better, not worse. All right, I've invited patron supporters to give me some questions for a pre-Christmas session, so we'll see what comes in for that. In the meantime, I will see you for the News Roundup video on Friday. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself.